I'm going to tell you four things about Bug for the Sega Saturn. One of them is false. Bug was supposed to be a Sonic game. Bug's development kit was slightly larger than a mini-fridge. Steven Spielberg praised Bug, saying, this is going to do it for Saturn, and... Despite its modern-day criticism and the IP dying early, Bug was a top-selling Saturn game. Let's start with the false one. We often see jewel cases, plastic boxes, and paperback covers adorned with quotes from celebrities and publications endorsing the thing. While this quote is not seen printed on the case for Bug, we do see it on several websites. One of the first 3D platformers in history, where a wisecracking insect who aspires to be an actor spends the game traversing a movie set filled with highly hazardous obstacles and stunts. Famed film director Steven Spielberg, after trying out Bug at a trade show, reportedly said, quote, This is the character. This is the character that is going to do it for Saturn. But did he really say this? It's all over the internet. Web articles about Bug, YouTube videos, forums, an IGN article, Wikia pages. Hell, the Wikipedia page embeds it like a badge to its Bug write-up. Many cite the IGN article, which does not cite its own source, but seems to have screen-grabbed it from some other website using the quote. With so many websites and even books saying it happened, the easiest thing to do is take it at face value and not think twice about its legitimacy. There's little shame in that. After nearly three decades of this info getting passed around the internet, its original source seemingly vanished. Many websites using the quote all say it happened at CES 1995, after Spielberg got a tour of Sega's booth. But let's discuss the contradiction. Bug wasn't shown to the public until E3 in May of 1995. CES was in January 1995. No reports from the gaming press show that Steven Spielberg even went to CES, and those writers do notice when celebrities appear. That and Bug itself was not shown at CES. It was not even revealed to the public until months later, and its demo was not shown until May at E3. When my Shiro podcast team asked David Warhol about the Spielberg endorsement, he referred to it as, quote, second-hand information and couldn't remember the trade show where it allegedly happened. Both Spielberg and Bug were at E3, so maybe it's just a typo? Nope. Turns out, the quote came from this proposal video for Bug 2, created by a friend of the developers during E3's opening day and presented to Sega execs that afternoon. It shows the quote at the beginning, saying it happened at CES in January, followed by dubbed over clips of Entertainment Tonight used in a mock interview with Bug's character, jokingly voicing over the quote from Spielberg. It was a joke! A joke that gradually morphed into interpreted reality by way of a three-decade-long game of telephone. Please, I'm begging you nicely, point that Spielberg quote away from the wiki pages. It's breaking the wiki pages! Thank you for joining us. I'm Mary Hart. I'm John Tesh. All the multimedia worlds abuzz about Bug, the feisty little insect who jumped, spit, and butt bounced his way onto the video game scene this year in his own fast paced hit title. Keith Robinson is the friend of the developers who made this video. You can hear him dub over the Entertainment Tonight hosts with Bug's voice actor on the phone. Here, in an exclusive interview, E.T. catches up with Bug via telephone. Where's my back, Rob? Oh, oh. It survives on Robinson's YouTube channel, which has a lot of his old source material. In the description for the Bug 2 proposal, Robinson says money was tight, so he whipped this together with existing game footage and TV clips the morning of E3, day one. The Sega execs who saw it that afternoon apparently loved the bit so much, they greenlit the sequel. Thanks, Bug. We'll be looking forward to Bug 2. It's highly possible that Spielberg may have come into contact with Bug at some point. He did go to E3 after all, reportedly hiring a 3DO developer during his visit. Spielberg did have a great professional relationship with Sega, shown in these pictures during his 1996 tour of Sega R&D. But did he actually say this at CES? Well, the Bug wasn't even shown there, so 
No. Sega did have delicious ham croissants, though. Amazing to think that what started as a simple joke would, over the years, turn into widespread pandemonium. application software department. This is where video games are created. My favorite moments of Mattel walking down the corridors and hearing the sound effects of my game being played in a court in some cube somewhere and it's like wow people are actually playing this thing this is pretty good and you hear them hooting and hollering over the cue balls. After getting his start at Mattel, David Warhol founded Real-Time Associates in the 1980s. His quick business connections allowed him to grow the company like a dandelion field. You know, it's kind of sad here, last day of Mattel, but, you know, it really shouldn't be. Mattel isn't dead. You know, we really built up a family here, some, some close ties, and that's something that can last forever. You just can't throw that out. We are closed now. Warhol knew people from Mattel and did sound design for companies like EA and Lucasfilm Games, allowing him to hire 100 developers within a few years. Times were different, though. Not all of them knew how to program. Honestly, uh, Real-Time Associates became known as the University of Real-Time because we were able to take people with little or no game development background and in very short order make them productive members of the game development community. There was no way you could... Uh, take a course to learn how to develop it. They weren't teaching these things in classes and they didn't have a lot of books. So it was a lot of um, hands-on exploration. Thanks to our good friend Kay, my Shiro podcast buddies were able to interview Mr. Warhol a few years ago. He spoke to us about how real-time associates would make licensed games, original software, and ports for just about every platform of the era. Except for the JAG. <laughs> they got an especially nice in with Sega, through titles like Captain America, Ren and Stimpy, and this fucking Barney game. Oh boy, a present. Oh boy, a rubber duck. Whoop. Look, it's a butterfly. Keith Robinson, that aforementioned cartoonist, is good friends with Warhol. So at one point, they made a game with Robinson's characters called Normie's Beach Babe Rama. Interestingly enough, I appear as a character in his cartoon strip. Whenever he needed a technology guy or a computer nerd or something like that, he had a cartoon character based on my likeness that was in his cartoon strip. And because we were developing a game based on his cartoon strip, and I appeared in his cartoon strip, I appeared in a game we were producing. I was the boss on, uh, I don't know, the third or the fourth level. You had to beat me playing a game of Pong. With several Sega games in their portfolio, what? the Big Blue Bastion would ask them to be a part of a top-secret collaboration. Sega put real-time on the Tiger Team. The year is late 1993. Sega's Mega Drive is outselling the Super Nintendo in the U.S., but overall sales across the 16-bit market are starting to decline. Many Japanese video game companies started reporting heavy losses in Western regions due to uncontrolled underselling. Some industry experts compared this trend to the historic Atari crash. According to a translated Nikkei article, in 1993, Sega of Europe went from 480 employees to 120, and Sega of America from 900 to 350. By this point in the 90s, it had become apparent that the big players in this industry better get on board with polygonal graphics on home consoles. The two Goliaths started working on their answer to the demand for 3D, but they need to buy time to make these next-gen machines good, especially with 16-bit slumping. They need to make money. Before the new year, two smaller giants would rush out their 3D home consoles, but it didn't take long for the world to realize they're no threats. Throughout Sega's kingdom, a few 32-bit hardware ideas are being developed at the command of CEO Hayao Nakayama. SOA still oversaw several great Genesis games in 94 and even 95, but it was also time to make the next big machine. Japan is toiling away at what would later be called the Saturn. In America, 
Project Mars is being led by its father, Joe Miller, when SOJ engineers reportedly asked them to make a cheaper Genesis. Miller and Tom Kalinske decided to instead make this a Genesis expansion, more capable of polygonal games, calling it 32X. 32X. Now you can look back and say, gee, that was a mistake. Remember, its reason for being was to extend the life of Genesis. You know, I was pretty skeptical of the of the Saturn uh, chipset and uh, and really wanted something a bit different and and I was kind of hoping we could keep Genesis going a lot longer right. and I thought if we did 32x and were able to provide the same kind of play as a 32-bit system on a 16-bit machine uh, that would help prolong the life of Genesis. It's so amazing! I can play arcade games in my own it's an effort to boost the lifespan of the slumping Genesis before Saturn gets unleashed. They often call it a stopgap. But throughout 1994, all the big next-gen hardware was revealed to be in progress. So instead of buying a 32X, many consumers wanted to just wait another year or so for the next wave of 3D consoles. The unfortunate part is, we in, at Sega US, Sega of America, the games we developed weren't good enough. And we were supposed to get support from Japan, and we didn't. You know, so we had a very limited number. I've got them all in my basement. Uh, uh, I don't remember how many it was. It wasn't very many. The already downsized staff at SOA are being sacrificed to make 32x games instead of investing development time for the incoming Saturn. Sega Saturn. In an effort to not totally ignore this mainline console. SOA decided to outsource the Western-developed Saturn launch titles to third parties. They're doing this with the Tiger Team. <laughs> Led by a handful of SOA producers. The Tiger Team primarily consists of Nova Logic, Jumpin' Jack Software, and Real-Time Associates. Those producers also oversaw a couple of localizations, but these three are the third parties tasked with making the first America-made Saturn games. The trio must finish their games in time for the American Saturn launch, scheduled for September 2nd, 1995. Nova Logic started making a helicopter combat sim. Jumpin' Jack began carving out a first-person mech shooter, and Real-Time Associates is going to make a Sonic the Hedgehog game. Sega signed us up, like I said, part of the Tiger team, and we were supposed to be developing a Sonic the Hedgehog game for Sega of, of America. So we signed our contract, and we were like, wow, we're going to do a launch set, uh, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog title for the Saturn. And Wait, what? Had, yeah, that, that's how we were originally contracted. If you go back and read the contract, it was to do that. I can so, tell you right now, David, like all of our like mouths just drop. We're all in different <laughs> states, and I can tell you, like, yeah, I, everybody's I, I, mouth just went, wait, what? <laughs> it's a crime we constantly hear about. The Saturn having the audacity to release without a Sonic game. Particularly in North America, this finger-wagging hedgehog defined Sega's image and success. It would be ridiculous for SOA to release this thing without a fucking Sonic game. And that's exactly what they would wind up doing in the end. But turns out, launching Saturn with Sonic was part of their plan all along. Since Yuji Naka was a little tied up with Sonic 3, it would make sense for SOA to take care of it. They signed the contract with Realtime, gave them elusive early dev kits, and sent them on a quest to make a Sonic game just in time for Saturn's launch. But dreams of this blue blur would soon vanish into the green hills. Yeah, it was it was at going to be an original Sonic for the um, Saturn using 3D graphics and, and all of that. Now, here's the thing is that as soon as the ink was dry on the contract and we we're getting ready to develop it, uh, Sega of Japan heard that Sega of America signed somebody up to do a Sonic game. And they were like, no, 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 no. So uh, here we were uh, with a full-on contract to develop a game for Sega on the Saturn, and we weren't allowed to use Sonic. So there were a couple of weeks there where Sega was scrambling up. We didn't want them to cancel the contract or anything like that. For whatever reason, 
Sega of Japan axed their Sonic project. We don't know exactly why, but we do know nowadays that Mr. Naka was protective of his work. Perhaps Naka and SOJ wanted to make a Saturn Sonic game of their own? Either way, SOA is now rushing to figure out what to do with real time. They already signed away the paperwork, so they have to make some kind of Saturn launch game. People at Sega started looking for some other IP that they could license for this video game. Warhol said one of the Tiger Team's head producers with Sega, Steve Apoor, went to bat for real time. He convinced Sega they'd be more excited about making an original game as opposed to yet another licensed game. Super Dean Duper! We had been toying with the idea of doing this game for the uh, uh, Genesis called Bug, and we had some uh, art concept, you know, some concept art sketches going back and forth. And um, at the time, Sega was wondering, well, geez, what. What character should we use for this game? We can't use Sonic, so what should we use? We can see early sketches of the character from Warhol. Big feet, bug eyes, classic gloved hands, and a menacing smile. This mischievous attendant actor is ready to take home an Oscar. What was once shelved as an old idea will get the starring role in Real Time's biggest project yet. And we presented, hey, let's make this game be about bug. Despite not getting the green light to craft a blue spectacle, we will see many design elements of Sonic get used in Bug. But before real time can draw some inspiration, they first need to draw some polygons and get any kind of base game running. In the company's history, real time made its own game engines for each platform it worked on. They're designing a level editor program for Bug. So a big part of the, the development path was coming up with level editors or graphic editors of our own device. Uh, as well as the, the tools that would take things from the editors and compress them into uh, ways to make them fit into ROMs. The team is fighting two battles at once, getting their engine built and making sure it fits into the Saturn's hardware constraints. And how about your frozen things? Oh yes, there's a place for them too. In this series, we hear other third-party Saturn developers talk about how Sega did not get them the Sophia development kit until the end of 1994, even though they started their games several months prior. At the beginning, we didn't have anything, and um, Mike went over to Sega of America to start working on it, because they didn't have anything they could give us. They would work on their stuff during the day, and when they were done, he'd come in and he would do what he needed to do at night because they didn't have any kits they could give out. So that's the only way that they could let us work on the kits was to let us borrow time from them at Sega of America. It was, it was insane. But the Tiger Team developers are granted special privileges with such a close tie to Sega. They're getting the mysterious pre-Sophia dev kit. Not much is documented about what this is, but through dev interviews, we have a general idea that it's goddamn humongous and difficult to work with. Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, it was a tough nut to crack. We got one of the first development systems, which is about a one meter cube with a bunch of microprocessor components inside of it. And they didn't have any development environment really or any tools, just the hardware. On top of not having any sort of tooling with this raw hardware, the beefy box was sent to just a few select developers before the Saturn console was finalized. So, specifications kept changing. Yukio Futatsugi made this work for Panzer Dragoon by intentionally making the art style simplistic in nature. For others, it was a tug of war, constantly needing to tweak their game anytime SOJ's engineers would alter Saturn's architecture. While we were developing it, anytime we would have gotten a new dev kit, it might have slowed us down for a week or two as we were integrating with the uh, either the new capabilities or they might have reorganized some of the architecture. Uh, so um, it, I wouldn't say it was uh, significant to the detriment of the product. It's, it was another technical task, but it was a moving target that we were developing for. Uh, but every time they gave us an update, we would uh, adjust our sites and 
uh, dial it back in and then move on from there. When we spoke with VirtuaCops developers, an AM2 team at Sega of Japan, they also told us about this massive cube. あの、僕が聞いたのは、なんか、ちっちゃい冷蔵庫ぐらいの、あの、箱みたいなのがあったっていう話を聞いたことがあるんですけど。<笑> <笑>でかいやつは今週回って移植あの移籍する前に他の部署を見ることあってそこんでまあでかいの基盤でかい基盤が2枚ぐらいで一方体組んでるみたいなやつがあってそうそうそうそうそうそれをであのクロックワークナ
It's way more storage space, but much longer load times. In a cartridge or a console, you could flip back and forth pretty much at a moment's notice, change levels in a half a second. On the CD systems, all of a sudden you had that little, this like you're drinking the ocean out of a straw, and there's only so much you could pull off it at a time. As if working with this uncharted beast wasn't hard enough, Real Time still has a game to design, and they're doing it all with a small team. The company has plenty of employees, but they're still working on other projects, since they constantly do ports and licensed games to make money. Let's play with the frog. <laughs> About a dozen people are working on Bug. That's a dozen people to wrestle with the difficult hardware kits, build an engine, artistically craft the world, the characters, create sound, music, design, and balance the levels, all in a time when 3D games had no standard, no roadmap. Despite these challenges, Warhol remembers this as a positive time. It was uh, just a pure pleasure to work with Sega. Uh, we were working very closely with them. We had done a number of titles with them before and after the Saturn work. Um, we had full access to their producing team, their technical team. Uh, we'd go up there every few weeks, at least once a month. They would come down to L.A. and, um, and chime in and direct. Uh, so at that time, they were growing. The, there was really no clear winner in the Saturn PlayStation Wars, so it, it seemed like it was an open playing field. Bug is believed by many to be the first 3D platformer ever created. Regardless of whether this is right or wrong, it's certainly one of the first in the genre. A pioneer before plumbers, marsupials, and purple boys could set any kind of standard. Platformers of the past traditionally restricted players to moving left, right, up, or down, navigating flat levels. With 3D polygonal games, the character can easily move forwards and backwards, shattering an entirely new dimension in the world they can occupy. Though real time is opting to keep things simple, Bug can move forward and backwards as well as left or right, but he's locked in these four directions, unable to move diagonally. Warhol calls it a quad scroller. Comically making use of the fact that Saturn renders quads, levels are constructed from box-shaped elements floating above an infinite plain ground and a painted backdrop. We never see the camera rotate. It's always facing the same direction, while Bug walks, jumps, and booty bumps around his boxy movie set. These characters and items are not 3D, instead making use of billboarded sprites. Chief character designer Jeff Cook cranked out these cartoon creations in 3D using soft image, then rendered the frames in 2D so they can fit in the constraints of the Saturn's memory. We've seen this done in Clockwork Night and like a million other 2D games to this point. Bug is a movie star on the rise. Paperback publications just can't stop buzzing about him. And action! The game takes place on a movie set where you're starring in a film about your family getting kidnapped by the bitchy Widow Queen Cadavera. Shout out to all them parents who bought this for their kids without seeing this on the back of the box. The gameplay is you, Bug, traversing six movie sets each split into three sub-levels, with a boss fight at the end of the third. You must weave around brutal occupational hazards, fighting insectoid creatures, finding bonus powers, and occasional bonus levels. After each movie set, you rescue a family member slash supporting actor. These sets can literally squish you flat and end the actor's life, but yeah. In between each world, you're reminded that this is supposed to be some sadistic workplace. It's one of the rare moments when the real-time team gets to flex all of its creative muscles, lunging away from their usual licensed projects. Insane music and all. The idea was, the original concept was, we want this to be like the Pink Panther on speed. 
uh, the, some little catchy, jazzy tune, but really fast and driving. I've spent like 30 minutes preaching to you about the history of Bug while barely scratching the surface of what it's like to play it. So let's start with the line on the bottom. Bug is stressful. Okay, all uh, weird YouTube references aside, uh, Bug is actually a pretty stressful video game. It's a true test of real time's discipline with balancing difficulty and designing level layouts. Bug's movie sets are often massive and punishing. You will encounter sections that are too easy just as often as you'll endure places with infuriating insta deaths. While wrestling with the at times slippery controls and often unfair avenues, the back of your mind is focused on the broken save system, dreading the thought of starting this entire game over. As I said before, each of the six worlds have three levels and a boss. Bug has hit points, decreasing whenever you're hit by an enemy, though falling kills you outright. It's one of those games with knockback anytime you get hit, so yeah, dying by getting knocked off a cliff will happen to you quite a lot. The hit points, the knockback, the insta-deaths while falling, these are all things we saw in real time's previous platformer, Normie's Beach Bay Barama. Your main attack is jumping on top of enemies with your booty stinger. You can obtain temporary power-ups like this zapper, upgradable spitballs, and brief invincibility. You have just one jump. When bouncing off an enemy, your fall trajectory can't stop, so you have to like really nurse the d-pad to make sure you're not falling into danger when bouncing off a bad guy. These little sugar cubes increase your movie gross, and coins let you enter the bug shower for a bonus stage. Hey, man, bug. They named this guy Daddy-O Longlegs. He's, canonically, Queen Cadavera's only surviving ex, described by the manual as a, quote, jive-talking hipster. The year is 1995. Bonus levels are these quick little timed setups where you can collect trophies, get enough, and they're converted into extra lives. Bug has finite lives and continues. There are some checkpoints where you'll respawn if you die. Okay, Mr. Hotshot Game Player, now what? If you have to use a continue, oh, great. that sends you back to the beginning of the stage. Action. If all three continues are used up, then that's it. Game over, asshole. Start over from the very beginning. <laughs> Many old dog Sega games do this, though in Bug, the levels are so unusually massive and challenging that losing like this can become majorly disappointing to the player. These levels are long. There are enough one-ups and extra continues to sort of mitigate this frustration, but like every time you need to use lives to learn a new obstacle or boss fight, you also have to get sent back to the beginning and replay multiple hours worth of game to get back to where you left off. But there is a save system. Sort of. When you get to a new world or a new movie set, whatever you want to call it, Bug creates a save file. It shows you how many cons you have left and how many save file uses you have left. You can only load the same save file three times. After that, it just vanishes. It gets deleted from your save memory. No joke. So if you're trying to play through Bug and have a life outside of video games, then good luck. So yeah, you have to learn the boss fights and the tough obstacles for what takes a skilled long player two to three hours to beat, 
while this finite amount of continues and limited save loads are constantly hanging over your head. It's stressful and it takes away from the fun. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that was intentional. I would say that that was more an artifact of tuning it while we were going and, and having the experts at the game set the skill level. Warhol says difficulty balance was not one of their strongest suits, since Realtime apparently had a bias against hiring staff who were exclusively designers. This might sound harsh, but that's literally what Warhol told us. They instead made people like producers and programmers also design the levels and adjust difficulty. So in hindsight, yeah, I would absolutely say our, our products could have benefited greatly from more focus on design and design innovation rather than, hey, does this have enough characters? Hey, uh, you know, do, does it meet the needs of our contract? Let's, let's get it out there. Uh, spending more time on the tuning and the, uh, the tuning and the fun factor would have, uh, would have set us on a different trajectory as a developer. Despite this neglect in level design, there is something special about Bug. We can easily examine the level editor their programmers made by doing a visual teardown. Their editor revolves around placing polygonal boxes along a set path. These boxes can be straight pieces, turns, vertical paths, and even upside down paths. The boxes can be stacked or sloped to create elevation, and more platformy jumps. Some boxes fly around and shuffle like a deck of cards. The boxes can have these invisible walls that Bug cannot jump over. No, with these visual borders in play, you must instead find a way around. The level editor can place enemies along certain pathways and add in things like bubblers, moving platforms, and springboards. When Bug jumps on a spring, he spins around, kinda like Sonic. Hints at what this game could have been if it really did become another Sonic game. So the game mechanics were similar to what we were planning for the Sonic game, uh, but the, you know, the whole character and art style and ultimately the gameplay uh, what became our own device. Uh, for the hundred or so games that we've worked on and released, I gotta say that's, that's coincidentally, gotta be one of my favorites. Wow. We're given another portal into what real-time Sonic game could have looked like in World 2's bonus stage. It's a race against Sonic. We can see the blue blur dashing through the same boxy layout as Bug. Unlike Sonic, Bug does not have a spin dash or really any fast movement at all. How would Sonic's inherent abilities have impacted these level designs? In Bug, the game revolves around a heavy amount of intricate movement across platforms, carefully jumping across dangerous cliffs, sometimes requiring you to bounce off enemies in really nerve-wracking setups. Would their Sonic game have been this difficult? Is it almost a good thing that they weren't allowed to make a Sonic game? Or would it have been a totally different experience? I personally do not think the level designs would have been as punishing if they just tried making a Sonic game. Like a true butterfly effect, I'm sure the end result would have been very different. Though, it would probably still be this quad-scroller concept. I know at the time, games started doing things like Tomb Raider. Hey, you can walk all over the place and all around. The thing about the mechanics of Bug that I liked is that there was no question whether or not you were going to interact with something. Uh, my example was if, you're, if a boulder is running at you and you have full 3D motion, there's going to be a pixel point where you collide with a boulder and there's going to be another pixel point where you don't collide with a boulder. And it's not going to be obvious given the graphic context. And I felt that... It's, it was a very simple decision or player decision to make uh, if we limited you to two dimensions instead of three dimensions. Like I said, the levels here are just massive. They take a while to navigate with many forks in the road. It gets really mazy. Some dead ends reward you with fleeting power-ups, extra lives, and hit points. These little pink bonus spheres sometimes give you goodies and at other times hurt you. I hate that. Bug likes to interject with smack talk and little jokes. That's right. No need to accuse him of copycatting Mr. Gould. 
They started making bugs before Gex came out. If you're annoyed by his dialogue, you can turn it off. Fun, Fun fact! John Frost, Bugs voice actor, worked in radio at KROQ in Los Angeles and KOME in San Francisco, doing characters, short jingles, and radio plays. Love line with Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla. We'll be right back. With how Real Time's level editor works, they struggle to find ways to create landmarks that clue you in to where you are. Accidental backtracking is common in the first two worlds. Later on in Bug, especially in worlds 3 and 4, the designers find their stride. Using the level editor to create landmarks, use more enriching colors, as well as make obstacles that are less frustrating and more entertaining. They start to add new things like switch-powered elevators, jumping between the floor and ceiling, moving spike walls, these bubble things, and some clever uses of the level editor to make puzzles. It's as if playing Bug gradually gets more fun the further you play, because the producers progressively learned how to make Bug fun. This makes the opening acts feel less polished and unfinished, while the latter two-thirds of the adventure reward you with what Bug should be, fun and engaging. Then, right when you get into a groove, you find yourself slingshotting across bullshit like this. Or you get to stuff that's just downright psychotic. Plus, the camera is occasionally busted, causing a handful of blind jumps. Collision detection is spotty. You might fall through platforms that should be solid and die, or clip through moving boxes, or get borked by moving platforms you can't see. Parts of the game are legitimately broken. You're also going to find some maddening difficulty differences with its boss fights. The first one, easy. Just jump on the slug over and over again. But like, it also has a zillion hit points. The fight just drags on and on and on and on and on. I just want it to be over. Boss 2 has this actually fun idea of catapulting rocks at the big bad homie, but it's also way too easy. Then you get to the third boss fight. A real test in patience and persistence. So here's what you gotta do. You have to jump on Lil Nessie while staying on this tiny, tiny platform. If you fall in, you're dead, start over. Remember, there's knockback. It breaks off into phases where you dodge its spit. Then, combine all three skills while staying on an even smaller platform that moves. You're also dealing with the existential dread of losing all your continues, being forced to start the entire game over, knowing the more you get killed, the less likely you are to move on and finish the rest of the levels. I died a couple dozen times to mean, watery, and snaky. Its shout sound haunts my dreams to this very day. <laughs> the rest of the bosses are easier. When fighting the large octopus, you get a racket for tennising fish at the dude's head, so that's kinda neat. An explanation for these sharp inconsistencies might be they had no way to test their level designs in their first few stages of development. In writing our own tools, we did a lot of the work in our own 3D level editor, um, which I, I think even then we got our level editor working well before we got our engine working. It's easy to criticize Bug's shortcomings, but we must also respect the incredible challenges faced by this small team. Again, they're coding this in assembly with the Cube, a hulk of a dev kit that Sega keeps changing the specs on mid-production. This at least allows real time to get a head start over the other third parties. They all had to wait for Sophia to come out in late 94. I do love the art style of these eclectic creatures. A producer told Sega Visions magazine they wanted Bug to be like playing Saturday morning cartoons. Big question though, why he walking around with that dump truck? Nice butt! This pag literally waves his donk right in the player's face on the game over screen. A vicious taunt for the frustrated controller wielder. If this acting gig doesn't work out for Bug, he can always fall back on making money as an insta-thought, being all like, Lincoln bio, am I right gamers? Oops. 
The bad bug creatures inhabiting this world take on a similar art style, sometimes with mechanical attachments, all up to some E for Everyone cartoon mischief. Sorry. It's the late 90s. Butts and farts are funny, I guess. So sorry. Just a Warhol's description of Pink Panther on Speed fits the vibe of the entire original soundtrack, and it really works for this realm of insectoid animation. I dig it. While at times repetitive, the vocal interjections from our star Bug are good for a few funny lines. Making you think you're inside something! It's just creepy! Or simply, the power to do things that you cannot do anywhere else. 64-bit, next-generation Mondo player! Marketing lies are occasionally told at CES in January of 1995, be them accidental or on purpose. But one thing we do know is Bug was still in development and not shown at this show. Neither the nondescriptus insect or Spielberg were reported to be in attendance. Real Time's big project is getting closer to ready. Warhol doesn't remember exactly when Bug started, but does remember it was a 12-month contract, set to end in either May or June, months before the Saturn launch. Or so they thought. I think when Yogi said fork in the road, he meant opportunity. When he sees opportunity, he takes it. So do we. We're taking all the opportunities we can to make this business soar. And since I began my remarks with an announcement, I may as well finish with another. We started our rollout of Sega Saturn yesterday. Our retail price is between $399 and $449. We have 10 software titles at retail in the next few days. 20 by August. Our total rollout will take the summer to complete. Why was the Saturn released over three months early? Sega of America president and CEO Tom Kalinske explains. The consumers really demanded it now. They know that the product's available in Japan. We've had a lot of people uh, buy the product for $800, the Japanese version brought over from Japan. And so we wanted to satisfy the consumer need. We were forced in the U.S. to launch earlier than we wanted to. We originally were going to launch in the, in the fall. We were forced to launch immediately in, in, in June. And we didn't have enough software. Hell, we didn't even have enough hardware. We couldn't ship enough Saturn hardware to retailers to give a, an average store four to six pieces of hardware on their shelf. And believe me, that caused a terrible, terrible uh, backlash. The Saturn launches early in North America, by surprise, at E3 in May 11th, 1995. Supplies were very limited. Today, Kalinsky says Sega of Japan forced him to do this to get the drop on Sony. It's hinted in interviews with Japanese execs that Sega of Japan lost trust in SOA after the 32X failed, taking back a lot of SOA's independence as a result. How did the selection of the titles work uh, coming into the Saturn? Uh, because of the IPs that you selected for the Saturn uh, as compared to the Genesis. With the Genesis, you had a lot of Disney games. You had the Sega sports games that just dominated the market. And you very much like to compete with Nintendo. And that really translated into the growth that you had in the market during the Genesis and the Mega Drive era. But with the IP selection that you had for the Saturn, it was IPs like Black Fire, Gen War, and Bug. Uh, what was the selection criteria for that? Uh, because uh, those kind of games that came into North America, they didn't hit well with consumers. Uh, what was that selection criteria like? Well, it wasn't a. It wasn't a criteria. We were given. We were told what we were what we could have and uh, in large part and so we didn't have a choice I mean we didn't need obviously we didn't even have Sonic for God's sake initially and that was a, a huge huge mistake <laughs> not having Sonic wasn't for lack of trying we didn't have FIFA soccer and we didn't have uh, Joe Montana football imagine what it could look like that wasn't our decision so that all come from Japan or like did they tell you hey produce this software don't produce this software. Is that basically what, what basically, that was like? Basically, that's what happened, yeah. It's the summer of 1995. Uh, 
lobbing off a few producers and replacing them with others, the Tiger Team was rebranded to Sega Away Team. Its producers oversaw those three Tiger Team dev houses while localizing Saturn games made in Japan. This includes things like changing Greatest Nine into World Series Baseball, according to this interview with GamePro. They were also responsible for localizing games like Grand Chaser, and some of Sega Away Team's producers are credited in American versions of games like Virtua Cop. But of the Away Team's various projects, Bug is by far the one they gave the most pomp and circumstance. The intro cutscene showing the press buzz for Bug is reflective of its real-life marketing frenzy. Once it was revealed at E3, the big green badonk got spread all over gaming magazines and trade shows. Warhol said at one of the shows, they brought in a six-foot-tall Bug statue. It might not have actually received Spielberg's endorsement, but at this rate, Bug doesn't really need it. Sega's already plugging enough of its PR dollars into our smarmy, I mean snarky, green antenna boy. Bug is proudly shown off to the public at E3. Sega Saturn's presentation highlights the emerging mascot to an eager live audience, who later gets the chance to try it out for themselves at Sega's booth. At the event, Sega gave this press kit to the various journalists who showed up. It includes this large packet, packed with juicy details about the Saturn, its hardware, and games. It says Bug literally transports gamers into three dimensions of challenging gameplay, boasting Bug's 18 levels and dashing good looks. Strangely, it also says Bug is, quote, now available for $39.99, but it isn't. Sega is falsely advertising Bug as a launch game. As evidenced by numerous Usenet posts and other sources, Bug is not out by May 11, 1995. Warhol says they missed deadline by a handful of weeks due to QA issues at Sega. Speaking of QA issues at Sega, in the video This is Sega Test, which showcases Sega's game testers, we see a clip of this game tester physically showing frustration at Bug. For almost the entire summer of 1995, North American Sega fans had a hard time getting a Saturn, and those who were able to find one were stuck with the meager offering of six launch games. All while this mascot platformer, pegged as a revolutionary leap in the platforming genre, kept getting plastered with advertising during a nearly three-month launch hype hangover. No new Saturn game came out in this time period. The surprise launch hype immediately followed by a game drought for North Americans. It's pretty safe to say, early adopters are not too happy about this. You can see all sorts of Usenet posts with nervous Saturn owners, wondering when the library might actually fill up with games. Many are taking to importing Japanese games this early in the console's lifespan, because they just can't get American versions of games. To reiterate, this was not Tom Kalinske's plan. The failure of the 32X seemingly prompted Sega of Japan to take some control back from their American parent company, forcing the early release. Kalinsky originally planned to wait until September 2nd, which could have potentially seen 20 games get launched with Saturn. We should also keep in mind the dozen 32X games out by May, all effort that could have instead been focused on Saturn. But no, SOA wasted that effort to a dead-on-arrival hunk of plastic. What if they instead brought in the games like Star Wars Arcade and Knuckles Chaotix as Saturn launch titles? That would have made for a much stronger lineup. Above all, eager Usenet posters are wondering when they can finally get their hands on Bug. They've seen the previews, they've absorbed the hype through photosynthesis. Now they want to play the damn thing. Of the six launch games, just Panzer Dragoon is a consistent heavy hitter, with the Daytona and Virtua Fighter ports losing a few points to their technical flaws. They still sold well. Tomorrow I'm gonna catch you. Craig, chill. You're a heavy hitter too, but like, a heavy hitter on the tee box, if you know what I'm saying. I'll show you my best shot. <laughs> Finally, the long-awaited bug came out on July 28th. We can see on Usenet, Sega fans are just salivating for the chance to finally play it. 
The wait is over. They're excited beyond belief. In the months surrounding its release, video game magazines are releasing their reviews of the game. Most of the big name publishers are giving it considerably high scores. Lots of 4 out of 5s and 9s out of 10s. A perfect rating here or there. What do you sell? EGM's review crew mostly slapped it with 8s. Ed calls it the kind of game that will put Saturn on top and says it controls well. Dano says the graphics are quote simply amazing. But the controls were disorienting because he's not used to a quote true 3D action game. Sushi says it's the best Saturn game out so far. The British Sega Saturn magazine gave it a perfect score, saying they're thankful a stall did not get released in Europe. They want bug. GamePro trends in the 4.5 out of 5 range, with Major Mike burying his face deep between those cheeks, but does admit the game's difficulty can be aggravating. Next Generation seems to be the only magazine setting hype aside in favor of an honest, albeit brief, review of bug. They say it's a noteworthy crack at breathing 32-bit life into the platformer genre. It reads, Although the concept is intriguing, the title is mostly a direct translation of 2D gaming using a 3D format. 3 out of 5. Our next adventure is a big one even though our hero is a teeny little thing from House of Buggin'. His name is Bug, and he's about to become a huge movie star. One of Bug's best defenses is a spitting image. Grab the spit wads when you can and hawk a loogie at whoever's bugging you. Ah, get away from me! This reptilian boss wants to slip you the tongue. Fun facts! In 1996, Games Master ranked Bug number 58 in its top 100 games of all time beating out the likes of Super Mario 3, Link to the Past, and Sonic the Hedgehog. Yet those games Bug beat all went on to get re-releases and sequels, still celebrated today. Bug got one sequel before fizzling out, never to make a buzz again. If it's apparently better than Mario, Zelda, and Sonic, and got widely praised by critics, then why is Bug so squashed nowadays? Could it be that the critics were out of touch with the readers? On August 1st, 1995, non-professional critic TJ posted this review of Bug to Usenet. They admit to not beating it yet since this game is quote, TOUGH! TJ opens by saying he was afraid Bug was going to be gimmicky, a first of its kind to the uncharted 3D platformer genre. We don't have to tell him he was wrong about that, just leave it be. But they go on to write nothing but positive things, a glowing review. TJ is impressed and recommends Bug wholeheartedly. Damak Joker is also praising it, scoring it 96 out of 100. Dave Z of Dave Saturn Page calls it a quote, revolutionary 3D platformer, smacking it with an 8 out of 10. The only negative of the era review I could find was my pal Sega Lord X, saying he remembers being disappointed by Bug when he bought it back in 95. On top of the rave reviews, GamePro says Bug sold 150,000 copies in 1995, making it the Saturn's second most popular game at the time, and they're apparently thinking about making it into a cartoon. So what gives? Why is it no longer popular? Why is Bug now a long-dead franchise? I'll tell you why. It's perhaps the only time where I will confidently tell you, this did not age well. I usually detest that saying in video game discussions, but it works here. Case in point, the average score for modern day reviews is much lower than the 1995 reviews. When Bug hatched, it was considered to be the very first mascot 3D platformer. There was practically nothing to compare it to other than 2D predecessors. But in just a handful of years, Crash Bandicoot, Super Mario 64, Spyro the Dragon, and the Sonic Jam Overworld would outshine Bug in every way. Smooth controls, more dynamic gameplay, actual focus on design and difficulty balance, a real f***ing game save feature. Hell, even Croc and Gex would swamp out Buggy Boy. It did get a sequel, one sequel, 
but by late 1996, Bugs Tricks were old hat. 3D games quickly moved on from boxy level designs and infuriating obstacles. The genre evolved, and Bug did not, leaving it to Darwin to snuff out the nondescriptist species. So what is the modern day merit here? Why should you play it? Why put up with the crappy save system that deletes itself after three uses? Bug is a history piece. This is living through and experiencing the birth of an entire genre. By playing Bug, you are physically interacting with the results of a team given a seemingly impossible task with unfinished hardware in an era where 3D was still all new, using an IP they created themselves. Bug is purely experimental. As Warhol remembers it, Sega really let them do whatever they wanted. Yeah, they gave us a tremendous free reign on that, and I think I remember uh, mentioning Steve Apoor, our producer, was a big advocate for that, saying that they were going to Sega would get the best work out of our team if they allowed us to have a lot of latitude. And I think they were happy with what we did. Among Sega Away Team's Tiger Trio, Real Time got their game out several months earlier than Blackfire and Genwar. Warhol says this is because, unlike his team, those other two did not want to trudge through Assembly or the Cube, opting to wait for Sega's C compiler to come out in late 94. This severely pushed back development for those games. Bug got a port to PC in the butt end of the 90s, along with a few other Sega classics. With this PC push came a marketing foray into Happy, I mean, Jackie Meal toys. Jack in the Box made these four toys to promote the PC Sega ports, including our cakey bug pal. Just for you guys, I went ahead and bought one, still in the packaging. Now, this is important. When buying old collector's items, it's key to ensure they're kept in pristine condition and never opened. Cracking the seal will permanently affect its resale value and potentially tarnish the historical preservation. It's honestly pretty high quality for it being, you know, the equivalent to a Happy Meal toy. This is a nice sturdy plastic, it's got a smooth sheen finish. The arms are, you know, sort of movable to an extent, but not enough to where I'm like comfortable twisting them around, worried they might snap off. And the antennas are nice and flexible little rubber doodads here. Overall though, I mean, if I were a kid in the 90s, I'd be pretty satisfied overall. And then, of course, we got the wind-up knob right off to the side here, and, uh, yeah. I enjoy platformers. I grew up on 3D platformers, so it's a genre I have a personal affinity with. Thus, every bone in my body wants to like Bug. Once I got to World 3, when its environments and designs actually became good, I would find myself getting into grooves as I bump the bug cheeks across enriching gaps and challenges. And then I get to some bullshit like this. Lose a ton of lives, get put on edge real quick. The save system is a bunch of crap, especially with it deleting your file after a set amount of uses. What a cheap way to up the difficulty. You could copy the save file to an external cart every time you progress, then copy it back if you lose too many lives. You could also use the level select cheat code or save states to pretend like you're able to save the game at each new level, or you could just play the Japanese version. Japan did not get bug until December of 1995 many moons after it hit the Americas. In this version, Bug has more hit points, starts with more lives, has more checkpoints, more ammo for your sub-weapons, and the save file has unlimited loads. You still start the world over when you lose all continues, but they recharge to at least three every time you load a save. Atop these tweaks sits the mighty adjustment of fixing Bug's camera. In American Bug, you will occasionally find yourself wrestling with where the camera is facing, making some hazards impossible to see at times. In Japanese Bug, 
the camera immediately swings whatever way Bug is facing. It's like they patched the game. In that GamePro interview with the Sega Away team, they talk about making American versions of Japanese games harder by eliminating continues, allowing fewer lives, and making bosses harder to kill. They're saying Japanese video game players prefer easier games so they can get through them more quickly, while American gamers apparently want more of a challenge. But this is just the answer they're giving to the gaming press. The real reason for this may very well be the legality of video game renting. You'd rather be playing video games. You can rent them from Blockbuster. In the 90s, renting video games was popular and legal in the US. Still legal, just not popular anymore. Over in Japan, video game renting was effectively banned through anti-piracy lobbying in 1984. If you rent a game and it's really hard, you're less likely to beat it during the rental period, so you might be more inclined to go out and buy it later. In Japan, you can't rent a game, so no matter how hard or easy it is, the publisher already got the money from whoever's playing the game. Now this might sound like some harebrained conspiracy, but this claim does have evidence to carry it. Masato Maegawa of Treasure fame once said in an interview, they were told by Sega of America to make the American version of Dynamite Heady more difficult. They were directly told by SOA that if an American game was too easy, players might beat it before the end of a rental period. So when Sega Away Team's producers tell GamePro it's because Americans want more challenge, they're probably feeding the media a load of So because the Japanese version is easier, rebalanced, has an actual save feature, and an improved camera, most of the footage you saw in this video is of me playing the Japanese version. And I can confidently tell you that's not cheating. It's a legit official version of Bug. If you think this makes me less of a video game enjoyer, Fuck you. Slap her head. Still, the nerve-wracking obstacles remain stressful. If you game over, you start the world over from its first level. A tough game, but at least the bull is less dumb in Japan. Entering Arachnia is a bittersweet experience, where the bitter is peppered with notes of anxiety. Saying it's like walking into hell is a bit too on the nose, so I'm not gonna say that. It just looks like what goes on in your body when blood pressure rises. Real Time is doing a lot of things correctly in designing the final showdown. This is about where difficulty balance should be in the final hour. It somehow does not feel like the idiotic type of hard like what we saw earlier in the game, say for this little number right here. Timing out these rocks is uh, uneasy. The upside down maze thing was actually really neat, and I also enjoyed the bouncy switch puzzle here. They really figured out how to do clever level design in World 6, with the pathways wrapping around each other as you go, aha, now I can cross over this gap I was unable to reach when I first got here. I leisurely stumbled my way down this active volcano, then through a less fun maze before finally coming face to face with the bitchy widow Queen Kadavra. The final boss is kinda easy. I almost feel let down. Maybe I just got good, I don't know. But for a game that kept me on my toes for several hours, I sure expected this to be more challenging than Nessie. Nah, it's like one of the game's easier boss fights. Didn't die once. Since butts are funny, you finish her off by shoving your bug-eyed face straight into her porcelain tsunami to send that clappable dumper right into the fires of Arachnia. Daddy-o Longlegs X is no more, and Bug wraps up another successful film. The more balanced offering for his homeland of the Nippon is something Chairman Segata can get down with, but he fully realizes Bug is rapidly eclipsed by future games entering the very genre it helped create. While Bug is not a perfect game, it is an important one. I highly commend David Warhol and the team of roughly a dozen who made Bug. I genuinely believe they fought an uphill battle to the very best of their abilities, and their fight was against a worthy adversary. Programming this thing with their own custom tooling in assembly on the cube before Saturn's hardware was finalized in a genre that basically wasn't invented yet using a graphical system that is yet to have its own standard while also contending with deadlines and pressures from Sega to make a successful mascot flagship is no simple task. But they did it. They gave it their damnedest, and to top it all off, 
they were legitimately successful for 1995. It sold well, it reviewed well, and it got loads of press attention. It was even greenlit for a sequel, in real time, greenlit for a slew of other Saturn projects. But like all of Sega's partners, their time with the Blue Giant was fleeting. As the PlayStation started to become the premier development platform, um, uh, I would say Sega themselves started scaling back and we started losing contracts we had with them. Uh, and so, you know, that wasn't necessarily a pleasant time as they were trying to configure how could they uh, command a, a lead or a, a relevancy in the in the console market at the time. And, you know, history kind of shows that PlayStation was able to take off uh, quite, you know, in command of that. This is not the last time we hear from Mr. Warhol in this series. And rest assured, not the last time we hear from our non-Dana Gould green friend. Until then, good day. A nice butt. working after like two or three wind-ups. <laughs> okay, okay, I gotta I got not laugh like that ever again. He said, Kai!